Jay here for Stretford Paddock. This is a one-on-one -on -one interview and joining me is Matt Slater from The Athletic. For the first time, I think, on the channel? Well, I did one from home. Oh, one for a second yeah. time on the channel. Forgive yeah. me, actually, yes. Uh, I'll tell you what is the first time. It's the first time we've had someone in a South End top on the channel. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, belated, well, hey? Come on. <laughs> yeah. Finally. We're long overdue and the channel's yeah, yeah. been poorer for it, if I'm being yeah, honest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, up the shrimpers and all that. Thank you. Um, we're going to get into it because the reason we asked you to come on the channel is your, your recent article about the Glazers and the takeover of Manchester United or the lack of takeover yeah. at Manchester United. Yeah, we're yeah. going to get into all that. Uh, but first of all, if you've not done so already, hit subscribe to the channel. We want to get to 800,000 subscribers. Also, there's a link in the description for The Athletic. Go and check out Matt's work at The Athletic as well. There's lots of other great journalists, many of whom we've had on the channel, like Laurie Whitwell, Carl Anker, Andy Mitten, all those good stuff, all those good people, sorry. Go and check it out. Um, first of all, Matt, I just want to ask you about your article. When you posted it, you published it, did you expect it to have the reaction it has? Because everyone was talking about it on my timeline and everyone was chatting to us like, have you read this? And it was getting shared left, right and centre. Did you envis envision that when you wrote it? Maybe not quite to the extent, but... Um Look, I've learned that if you write about Manchester United, you're going to get lots and lots of lots and lots of feedback, and uh, particularly on this story, this story has become a you know a global story. It's um, it's become a saga, to be honest. But yeah, look, uh, Manchester United take over the timing. I think it was to be honest, it was my boss's idea, right, okay. and it really was very a, honest of you. And it really was a look. We haven't said anything on this for a while. Yeah. And some of the names you've just mentioned there were like, well, that's because there's nothing to say. Yeah. And it was sort of like, okay, well, should we just at least give Man United fans an update? There must be something. Yeah. And we all started sort of sharing what we'd heard, which was bits of this, bits of that, and we put together a bit like a sort of jigsaw puzzle. Well, actually, there probably is a story there, but the story is about why there isn't a story. Yeah. You know, we've got we've got the the pieces of this sort of puzzle, uh, and it's all very well us knowing it. I think maybe we should share, even if it doesn't feel like, as a journalist, you've really moved the story on. All you've done is explain why we haven't moved the story on. So it was kind of a strange one yeah, to do, yeah. but it was once he sort of kind of poked us. Come on, who's going to be braver and who's going to write it? We sort of looked at each other, and it was my turn. But anyway, that's that's the story of the story, yeah. and it did do well. Um, and I think it was a combination of timing, and the, you know that, that, that no one had really written anything big for a while. How easy or difficult was it to get the information to put this together? Because you could, you're talking about you know why what's happening with the takeover, why it seems to have gone a little bit flat. You're also looking at the, the two main bidders in terms of Sir Jim Ratcliffe and um, Sheikh Jassim. How difficult is it to get that information and to get the right information as well? Because there's a lot of stuff out there that's you know you can't really trust, and then there's other stuff that you go, okay, there could be something in there. Yeah, so I suppose with a story like this, and this has been the case from November, you've got pretty soon it became a two-horse race. So yeah. certainly by February, January, February, it became a two-horse race. Um, putting aside the various private equity firms that want to buy a minority stake, but Two horse race, so you've got those two people there, you've got the club, and you've got Rain. Rain, who are basically speaking on behalf of the, of the Glazers through this process. Now, all four of those parties officially aren't talking, are they? So if you go back to the beginning of the story, yeah. which was the statement that was posted on the club website, we're exploring strategic alternatives. Strategic alternatives. I think the last yeah. sentence is something along the lines of, uh, we're not going to do a running commentary, I'm paraphrasing here slightly, yeah. and we will inform you when there's a, a, something meaningful to tell you, but kind of in brackets, you know, don't expect lots and lots of info, you know, that we're telling you the big story, yeah. and we'll inform you when it's over. Now, if we were going to take them at their word, what on earth have we, any of us been writing about for eight months? <laughs> right, yeah. Because they've just said we're not going to talk. Yeah. And they got everyone who wanted to bid, who wanted to take part in the process, has signed a non-disclosure agreement, which is totally standard yeah. in takeovers. So really, you could have had, wow, that's an amazing story. Manchester United, the biggest club in the world, or certainly the biggest club in this country, for sale. We're just going to have to wait, aren't we, for a resolution here? But that's not how life works, is it? No. I mean, you know, so all the way through the process, every journalist who's been on this story has been speaking to the club, and the club has a massive media operation. They've been speaking to Rain, and um, you know they are a merchant bank, a bank based in the States, and they're not 
necessarily used to dealing with loads and loads of requests from the media, but you know they're, they're getting the hang of it. Yeah. Um, and we've been speaking to PR companies who've been hired by the bidders right. to deal with inquiries from people like me. And most of those inquiries go along the lines of what's going on, and they'll say, well, obviously we've signed a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't speak at all about the bid beyond the two statements they put out, I think, in February. Yeah. You know, it was whatever, it was four or five pars from Radcliffe, four or five pars from Sheikh Jazim. But you ask them, you say, well, look, we've heard this, because first of all, human beings can't keep a secret, and everyone's talking about this. There's people at the club, people at agents, people, you know, there's, there's loads of people chatting away and you'll often end up saying to these PR companies well we've heard this and we're going to write this unless you steer us otherwise unless you tell us we're completely wrong and it's a bit of a dance and we've all been doing this dance for a long time on other stories and you start to work out you start to build a relationship and if someone says to you look don't write that because it's wrong and you'll look stupid yeah you'll go okay certainly if there's trust there and other times they might say, all right, look, I can't deny that. Right. All right? Yeah. You didn't hear this from me, but I can't deny that. And that's sort of how it goes. Now, this story has gone on so long, and there have been so many false dawns and, I wouldn't say fibs, but kind of things that weren't quite true. Some, some relationships have got a bit frayed. Some, some trust has been earned and lost along the way. Yeah. And it's been a difficult one to, to cover, to be honest. I mean, this is kind of my bread and butter. This is what I do cover, football takeovers. And this one has been, I don't know if it's, it's because of the size, it's, it's what's at stake. You know, the prize is Man United. Yeah. I think some of it is to do with Manchester United being a listed company. So a lot of the sensitivity around not breaking NDAs has been higher than normal. Yeah if you're not dealing with a listed company. So it's been a hard one to follow. So it's a very long-winded way answer really to say that it's been like other takeovers where you are speaking to all the parties and it's been unlike because it's been tricky. You know, the, the parties involved have been tricky. Rain are not natural speakers. The Glazers are not natural speakers. They're not natural communicators. They don't communicate very well with their staff. They don't very communicate very well with the club. No. So there's been an awful lot of people filling in the gaps. There's been an awful lot of guesswork at times. To get to this story, it was just th piling it all in and just having a look. And what, what of these bits can we double source? Can right. we triple source? Yeah. You've heard something interesting. I've heard something interesting. Can anyone corroborate that? And that's an ongoing process. So everything that went in that piece has been double, triple sourced. Yeah. There's, there's, there, is, there are no guesses in that piece. Right. Where I'm guessing, and if we, we can talk about some of the guesses, I make quite clear I'm guessing and explaining right. why we're guessing. Yeah. But if there's something gone in there that is not qualified, it's because we've double, triple sourced it. Definitely. And just... If we look at the, the difference that you mentioned there, you mentioned Ineos and you've mentioned Sheikh Jassim, the main differences in the bids, are we talking, because it does seem, and from what I've read and from your article and others, that it's pretty clear cut that Sheikh Jassim is full 100% of Manchester United Football Club, everything, so it, the Glazer shares, the other shares that are available. So Jim Ratcliffe, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, shall it we does, say, yeah. because there's talk that maybe it's 51%, maybe it's 69%. Maybe there's an option for the Glazers to stay on. Maybe there isn't. I think maybe we talk about the Ineos bid. How does what, yeah. what's the sort of setup there? Well, you're right. So go back to what's for sale and who's doing the selling here. So the only if you, the best statement we've got is the original exploring strategic alternatives. Yeah, the Glazers are majority owners of this club are exploring strategic alternatives that could be a sale, a partial sale, could be raising some finance to do all the work they want to do at Old Trafford and the training ground. It could be anything, right? Yeah. But we're the ones doing it. Not that lot over there at the New York Stock Exchange that own 31%, us, yeah. our shares. Now, Ineos, if you like, it's almost like the sort of kid that reads the exam question properly versus the kid that doesn't read the exam, yeah. you know, and, and, and answers it, that writes an amazing essay on the wrong thing. Yeah, I've been there. Ineos have read the exam question and gone, right, the Glazers are, are thinking about selling their shares. 
right, okay. Jim Ratcliffe has built an entire empire, an entire business on buying companies that are no longer loved or they're out of fashion and, and getting control pretty quickly. He's really good at that. He's, he's, he's done dozens and dozens of these deals. How do I get control of this asset that I want to buy, that I want to run it better, and I want to sort of build it and, and add it to this, this empire, this conglomerate, this, this, this very unusual business which is Ineos? So he's, he's thinking, right, how many shares have they got? Okay, how many shares would I need for, for, for control? How much can we afford? What's the value of the business, yeah. the entire business? And I'll get into that in a bit because it's really important how people, have, I think, have got confused about how people are valuing the business. Okay. This is to do with enterprise valuations, which is really important. But just on the shares, Radcliffe is saying, right, well, we just need 51, right? 50 plus one. Yeah. Okay, so what's the total value of the, of the company? Okay, well, we'll just go half of that plus a pound, plus a dollar, right? We could, get, we could gain control of this, this business for two, three billion dollars. Right, they, there's our bid, there's our bid. Now, everyone's gone, oh yeah, but that's not the full buyout, is it? It's not, it's not removing the glazers. It's not, it's not, not, it's not straight away. But if you look at Radcliffe's business story, he gains control of all of his companies. Yeah. He's actually not brilliant at delegating. He's actually not great at being a, in joint ventures yeah. or having minority partners. He eventually gets control of everything. Yeah. Ineos is a very simple company. He owns 60% of it, and his two lifelong buddies and friends own 20% each. Right, okay. It's a very simple company. Not listed. They've, they've maintained private. It's a privately held company. Right. Those three guys own the lot. So his bid is, is a stage takeover. And these are the bits we don't know. This is where I and anyone else talking about this is getting into guesswork. How much is he initially buying? And what the terms of the, the, the second part of the takeover would be? We're not sure. We're guessing two, three years. The bits that we all have to guess at are the Glazer bits. Are all six selling? The two want to stay on? We often hear that Joel and Avram want to stay on. At what point do they want to stay on? Do they want 5% five, five each, 10% each? Are they happy to pull their shares? Do the rest of them all want out? Yeah. These are the bits we don't know. And these are the bits that change as well. You know, we keep asking, keep asking. People who know them, people who know them from the NFL, from other sports. What do you think the Glazers are going to do? Oh, you know, I don't know. It changes. Yeah. And this is, this is, so the Glazers have been the hardest part of it to work out. I think the Ineos bit, which I know has driven a lot of the debate, is actually quite simple. He will pay as much as he needs to pay right now to gain control. Yeah. And then he'll, he'll, he'll buy them out. He'll buy the lot out. He'll, he'll take it private. He'll take the company private. So he'll buy the rest of the Glazers out at some point, and he'll buy the other 31%, perhaps at the same time, or maybe as a third stage. Does but he, but he, he will not let 31% just sit there on the, on, on the New York Stock Exchange. Because that's thrown a bit of a spanner in the words. And there's talk of the 31% being unhappy, and there's, that's confused it as well. But he can just, his bid, if the Glazers accept it, he will take over the 31%. They can't stop that. Is that is that right? Because well, there was talk about I know we don't want to yeah. go off on a tangent, but there's talk that maybe they could stop that from. They can certainly make it. Look, they can certainly slow it down. And this is this is where we 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 are guessing is guessing, right? Because we because we don't know if the Glazers uh, how much they want to retain. We don't know if all of them want to retain some shares. If it's only Joel and Avram, how many? And this is really important because Radcliffe has to get to for argument's sake, just say 51, right? He has to get to 51%, otherwise what's the point? Yeah. No one wants to be 49, no one wants to be 40, no one wants to be the large minority shareholder. He wants control, he wants to make the decisions here. So he's gotta, he's gotta buy enough Glazer shares to get him to 51. And you start to do math, maths in your head, okay, well that potentially could leave 18, right? For, the, for Joel, Avram and whoever else, Brian and the rest of them. But it gets a bit complicated because of the whole share structure that goes right back to the, the flotation, where only the Glazers have these super shares, these Class B shares, that give them 10 times the vote. So while they've only got 69% of the actual shares, when you add them all up, they've got about 98, 99% of the votes because their shares, and only the Glazers can have these super shares, have 10 times as, as many votes. Now, 
the way the Articles Association, the constitution of the company works is when you sell a Class B share, so when a Glazer sells a Class B share, it immediately becomes a Class A share. It loses its magic powers. Right. Now that's the way they've been, that's another one of the ways they've been making money from the ownership of Man United. So they floated, I can't remember how much they floated initially, um, 20 odd percent or so, and they've been selling chunks of shares over the last decade or so, often whenever it's hit $20. And the minute those shares get sold, they become the normal, the normal shares. So the question then is, well, okay, so if you're going to sell your shares, does this mean that Radcliffe, they, they, they lose the magic powers and they become normal Class A shares? Because if they don't, everyone that's ever bought a share from you before is going to be like, hold on a minute, why, why is he getting this? Right, special special right. treatment. Yeah. I bought I bought some shares from you two three years ago, and they immediately became Class A shares with the normal voting strength. So that's 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 an issue. You know, you are treating different shareholders differently, and that's just as a principle, you don't do that. And I and, and you know, there are kind of rules around takeovers. If this was a UK company or a, or or, a, or an actual US based company, when you make an offer to buy a, a company to sort of take it over. You're kind of supposed to sort of make the same offer to everybody. Yeah. And are they? Right, Is Radcliffe? Okay. Mm. It's debatable. Yeah. It's very debatable. Now it's actually a Cayman Islands registered company, and the rules there are slightly different. But I've been talking to lawyers about it, and 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 they've been sort of going, mm, bit of a grey area this one. Really? Yeah, a bit of a grey area, which which again goes back to uncertainty. So the Glazers are sort of thinking, Radcliffe might be offering me more money for my shares. And it might be an easier one to go through in terms of what the Premier League has to say, UEFA has to say. But my word, we might have some problems with our shareholders. Right. Okay. We might be tied up in litigation with them for a year or so. We might win. Yeah. But it's not easy. It's not as easy as, as we'd like it to be. Yeah. So that's, that's the problem with the Ratcliffe takeover, that there is a potential litigation risk with all those, with the 31, if you like. In terms of Sheikh Jassim then, is it just open and shut? He wants the 31%, he wants the 69%, he wants everything, and it's, you know, yeah. they agree to it, it's done. Yeah. He can just go in and go, look, here's, the, here's all the money. The, you know, absolutely. Give me the keys for, obviously. Yeah. You know. The strength of his bid, he's like your cash buyer yeah. house. It's easy. No chain. Great. This one can sail through. There might be some issues, regulatory issues elsewhere, yeah. but in terms of how you handle those 31%, goes through and a really good way of explaining that is you just look at the share price so every time Sheikh Jazim looks like he's in the lead so yeah. February and yeah. then again I think around March and then again in early June yeah when it looked like he was going to get the deal done share price spikes now that is basically speculators buying Man United shares because they think the Qatari one's going to go through, bang, we all, so it, it, they're basically buying free money. Right. So if they can buy something for 20 on $22 and uh, some guy's going to come along and buy the lot at 24 25 well, there, there's your that arbitrage. You've just made $3. You've yeah. just made $3 a share. It's free money. Now, whenever we think Sheikh Jazim isn't going to get it, you just watch the share price drift away. Yeah, yeah. Oh, all right, it's not going to happen. No, it could be Radcliffe. We might have to wait for our money. We might, not, we might never get it. Yeah, yeah. Or they hold on. And you start to see the share price drift away. Right. So Jazim, Spike, yeah. Radcliffe, Radcliffe staying on, drifts away. You address this in your article, and one of the sort of questions that I think a lot of fans had was, why doesn't Sheikh Jassim just come in and go, because if he's got access to the Qatari state wealth, which, let's be honest, he has, he can come in and go, right, here's six mm. and a half billion or seven billion or whatever, blow Rat Radcliffe out of, out of water, and get the club and move forward in the way that he wants to. But we haven't seen that. We haven't seen that, and there's a reason for it. Why, why is well, that? Well, you're right, we haven't seen it, and uh, much to the disappointment of the Glazers and, and Rain Group, I think. And, you know, there's certainly a theory, and it's a pretty good theory, that this entire eight, nine month dance has been about getting them to do that. Just dragging it out. Come on, come on, Shay, yeah. come on, you know. We know you can afford it. Yeah. You're, you're doing this in cash. You said you're going to clear the debt. What's another half a billion between friends? Yeah. There's a big problem there. 
the, the Qataris are sick of being taken for mugs. Right. And if they overpay in this deal, they worry that they'll be asked to overpay on the next property deal, the next time they, they buy a chunk of Uber or Starbucks or whatever it is, the next time a piece of large piece of real estate comes up in Manchester or London or Paris or Geneva or wherever it might be, oh yeah, be, you, know, you didn't mind overpaying in May United. Yeah. I think those days are gone. And the clues have been, there's been a couple, again, interesting clues. We, we always, we're always having to interpret you know, these small little utterances. So the briefing at the beginning we got was, we're gonna be disciplined. That was the code word, disciplined. Okay. We're not just gonna throw money at this, we're gonna evaluate this business properly, and we're gonna make a, what we think is a good bid. And they've often sort of talked again off the record about, well, look where the share price is. Add up all the shares, you get the market capitalization. The, the wisdom of the stock market thinks that Man United is worth about three and a half billion dollars. We're offering way more than that. Yeah. There's a premium. What, 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 what's the problem here? Yeah. And Radcliffe kind of agrees. You know, their, their bids are, there's nothing between them now. Right. Not really. Um, so that's the first clue. The second clue was Sheikh Jazin's father, whose initials are HBJ, that's how he's known. He was the former prime minister and foreign minister of Qatar, enormously, enormously powerful. Him and the former emir of Qatar basically modernized Qatar. Right, okay. Where Qatar is now is really the product of these two guys. Yeah. They were an amazing partnership. They found all that wealth in the ground. They made this big bat bet on gas, was, was, was Qatar's great breakthrough moment. They really went big on gas as opposed to oil. They hardly export any oil these days. That's all just for internal purposes. Massive, massive bet on, on liquefied gas, which, which can be transported around the world. Other Gulf states thought they were mad. No, 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 we're going to do it this way. Qatar's been coining it ever since. Now that money, HPJ and the Emir, just spread around the world. Yeah. And he's made a fortune, you know, and he's, he owns large chunks of London and Paris. And he gave an interview to Bloomberg, I think it was, uh, February-ish, where he sort of dropped a really interesting hint. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure about this Man United thing. Yeah, so well. But my son seems to like them. <laughs> yeah, so maybe there's some money in it, right? Every golf expert I spoke to just said that is a message to the market. The dad, yeah, whose money this really is, a big chunk of it, is saying we are not going to be taken for fools here. All right. I've got the purse strings. I'm saying I'm not quite sure. My son's managed to convince me there's a, there's, a, there's a return on investment here. All right, we'll see how this goes. Yeah. But we are not going to be blowing anyone out of the water. And I suppose the, the flip side of that would be then Sir Jim Ratcliffe, because, I mean, I saw recently, I think it was the, the, the Times Rich List valued him at, yeah, around, yeah. was it 29 billion yeah, yeah, or that's something? Part. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's gone up a lot. Gone up a lot. Yeah. You said they own 60% of Ineos, yeah. which is worth billions. Well, that's where most of the wealth well, is. Yeah. yeah. So... I suppose the argument could be, okay, this guy's got this money and if he's, you know, he's yeah, a yeah. Manchester United fan, born and bred and comes from Failsworth, I think, and all the rest of it. And this is a labour of love rather than a business venture as, as, he, as he's sort of has been told to the press and he said in the past. Why doesn't he, doesn't, why doesn't he come out then and go, Good question. right, okay, here's your extra half a billion. Yeah, yeah. I can get the club or 69% or whatever and start building United the way I want it to be built. Because that's not how he made his 29 billion, Jack. <laughs> right. You don't, you don't run around you know, getting all emotional about these things. Yeah. So he built that business sort of piece by piece. It's, it, I know I don't want to bore people here, but it's a petrochemicals company. People have got their head around that. It's actually about 30 different businesses. It's like right. this sort of loose federation of businesses. He bought bits from ICI, bits from, from, from Dow, these other massive multinationals. He basically bought the unfashionable bits. So oil and gas was kind of sexy, and a lot of these large conglomerates had chemicals businesses and the stock market was saying lose the chemicals businesses because it's not like very sexy and um, it's, it's, it's low return stuff. He went fine I'll have that, I'll have that, I'll have that, I'll have that, I'll have a plastics business, I'll, I'll do this, ethanol and he's bolted together this incredibly useful conglomerate of stuff that the table, the clothes we wear, yeah. you know it's all their ingredients are in there and for 20 odd years no one really knew this company because they're not they don't have their own brands. It is building block stuff. 
and it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. He's then sort of hit this age in his life. I think he's a, a midlife crisis is being a, bit, a little bit rude, but I think he's got, he's got to a point where, look, we're really good at chemicals, we're really good at plastic, we're starting to do a bit of oil and gas. I'm going to have a bit of fun now. Yeah. Sport, Ineos Grenadier, the, the 4 by 4 that's a consumer brand. That is the first time that he really cares about name recognition. Ineos. Before, Ineos, what's Ineos? I've got no idea. Yeah. Now he wants people to know what Ineos is because he's going to try and sell you a car. Then he starts buying uh, uh, Belfort, the fashion label. Again, a, a failing British brand. I'm not saying that Man United are a failing British brand. But that was the idea. Okay, yeah, right? yeah. He, li he likes the clothes. Yeah. Then he starts getting into hand sanitizer. Right, I'm going to start selling you domestic house household cleaning products. So for the, for the first time in a sort of 25-year business career, longer, because he was in private equity before that, he cares about the Ineos brand name. That's where sport comes in. And it's sport, and it's the cycling, it's the F1, it's the sailing. And a lot of it is stuff that he loves. His company are sports mad. It's like woven into the company. They're very competitive. So yes, he could overspend. He could, he could go for it. But every single one of his, these little companies that he's bought, he genuinely believes in the return of investment. I, I don't think I'm losing money. And, and we probably got the most from Radcliffe about a week or so ago when he, they, they launched a book. Yeah, so, so there was a book, a book launch of a 25-year story of Ineos. And there's quite a lot of clues in the book just about his approach to business, um, his love of sport. He mentions Man United a few times. Um, but then he also gave some interviews last week at the book launch. And he said, I, I don't think we'll lose money. If we do this right, I don't think we'll lose money. You know, we've, we've put in a competitive bid. You know, I think we value the business properly. I think we do a good job. Blah, 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 blah. People can disagree, agree, whatever with all that. But the important bit was that he doesn't think he is going mad yet. And he won't. He won't. For all the same reasons but for different reasons, if you know what I mean, with Sheikh Jazim. Yeah. Because he has built this business in a disciplined way. You know, he doesn't like losing money. He says that about 18 times in different ways in the book. I don't like losing money. Yeah. I think you had that quote. There's a quote from your article that I just thought, I thought summed it up perfectly when it came to the, the bidders. And you said, fear of looking daft has trumped fear of missing out. Yeah. So they don't, yeah, <laughs> they don't want to look stupid. They don't want to look like, yeah. oh yeah, we're someone who can get our pants pulled down. Like you say, whether that's for future investments, future yeah. businesses, or, you know, shit, just seem having to explain well, it to his dad why you're overpaid or whatever. I think the other thing to point out is, so why did Man United, why did the Glazers put it on last year? And don't forget the Liverpool had done it two weeks before. Yeah. So why did these two US, these two American ownership groups around the same time decide to do the same thing. I think there are a couple of reasons. And the big one is Chelsea. So they saw what happened with Chelsea, which was a very unusual forced sale, yeah. but it did create competitive tension, a proper auction where Desire Blassett, London club, one of the big six, good brand, good squad, someone had already, already thrown money at it. Yeah. Right? So there's, we didn't need to do that, someone had already been Pumping the prime, uh, priming the pump. We can just buy in, great. And he's got, he's got to sell. This guy's got to sell. So there's going to be a winner. There's a time, there's a deadline as well. And it got the bidders that the Glazers and Family Sports Group really wanted. Massive North American private equity, big money. Harris Blitzer, um, Palayukos from Bain, and they and they went for it. And they they banged they banged heads, and they got a really good number, two mm. and a half billion. For, for, for Chelsea, which sort of sent it, set a new benchmark. Man United and or Family Sports Group and, and the Glazers are looking at that and going, well, we're bigger than Chelsea. Yeah. So whatever Chelsea got, we're getting double. And don't, don't, don't forget that Rain did that process as well. Yeah. So Rain are in the business of selling football clubs. Ah, do you see what we just did for, for Abramovich? Yeah. We, we got on that number. And, we, and the beauty of that process was they were losers. Bowley won, but we've got three losers. Yeah. Who've just told us, they've just told the world they're happy to pay two and a half billion for a Premier League football club. Over here, sir. Yeah. But it didn't happen. It did not happen in quite the same way. Now why? I think it's because of the 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 global economy changed. Interest rates went up. Yeah. I think it's also because 
everyone got a little bit excited at Chelsea. And everyone then took a step back and went, oh, maybe they overpaid. Yeah. And I think that is what the Glazers and the Fenway Sports Group walked into. A feeling that, ah, two and a half billion was perhaps a little bit lumpy for Chelsea. Yeah. And the cost of money's gone up because of interest rates. There was a couple of big sales in the States as well. Denver Broncos. Uh, there's another one I've just forgotten. The Washington Commanders. There's quite a lot going on in the, in the world of the US billionaire. Yeah. And don't forget that one of the sovereign wealth funds have just been taken off the table because of Newcastle. Yeah. I think Man United were quite hopeful that maybe a Saudi bid would emerge. Yeah. It didn't. It might do another time, but it didn't. And it just took, it just, it, the, the auction never took off in the way that they wanted it to. And that, I think, has been one of the reasons why we're here today talking about it. So with that being said then, the fact that they didn't get this auction they, they wanted and the fact that you've got Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Sheikh Jassim sort of digging the heels in a little bit and going, we're not going to keep pushing this, we're not going to go into silly, I know it's already silly money, but we're not going to go into sillier money. Does that still leave then a scenario where the Glazers say, okay, then we're not going to sell because we can see, because there is this argument as well, which I know you've spoken about, that the club is going to increase in value over the few next few years because we don't know what's happening with sort of you know TV money and everything else that increases the value of football clubs. There's a chance that Manchester United could be worth say seven or eight billion in a few years' time. So the Glazers look at it and go, okay, we're not going to get this auction we wanted. Should we just take a step back and keep hold of United for a few more years? Is that a real yeah. scenario? I'm, I'm sorry to upset everyone here. But uh, the longer this has gone on, the chances of that have just gone up. Yeah. You know, the people I talk to about football club takeovers, you know, have, have, have gone backwards and forwards on this. Yeah, I think you know, I think the Qataris will get it in the end, just because of that weight of money that they want it. Once they enter something, they want to win. To oh no no, I think you know, don't underestimate Radcliffe. You know, canny fella, he wants to be the last bidder. You know, maybe him. To uh, there was a there was a period. Of, it was around sort of. March, maybe into Aprilish, where it appeared, I think the Glazers might hold on, but they'll 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 sell a stake to a Sixth Street, an Aries, one of these private investment funds, Carlisle, or someone like that, Elliot, and that will give them the money they need for the stadium. They never want to spend their own money. No. Right, blah, 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 blah. Right. So but then the longer this has gone on, it's like, do you know what? For everything that I just said about 2022, where Chelsea have just been sold, right? Maybe this is a moment. And the European Super League didn't happen, which for a lot of these American guys was, how do they go from this valuation to that valuation, to yeah. NFL style valuations. Project Big Picture, if you remember that one, that didn't happen. A couple of sort of setbacks, if you like, for American ownership groups didn't happen. And also I think the sense that uh, Man City are starting to look pretty good and pretty settled. How do we compete with that? And here comes Newcastle maybe it's time to cash out. That was, the, that was all the stuff that was going on in 2022 that yeah. drove, I think, that decision to explore strategic alternatives. Okay, here we are, eight, nine months on. Hasn't happened. I think things start to change. I think the advisors around them will start to go, all right, we didn't get the sale off that you wanted. We didn't hit the number that we promised you. Uh, the global economy perhaps didn't crash the way we thought it would. Perhaps there is now and light at the end of the tunnel in terms of interest rates. Perhaps with the changes to the Champions League, not quite as good as a European Super League, but maybe they might not be, you know, they might not be so bad. Yeah. You know, extra games, um, extra place for the Premier League, yeah. almost certainly. Um, Club World Cup, FIFA were talking about that for ages. They've actually finally managed to get it, get it off. Uh, it's there in the diary, that's expanded. That's going to be pretty cool. Should we should we hang around yeah. and just see what those two new tournaments for clubs like us do to our bottom line? And maybe in a year or so's time, we get to the end of the next TV deal. Maybe Apple, who've just gone mad, not mad, who've just uh, put their toe in the water in a big way with MLS, going for a global streaming deal. Maybe they'll give Sky and TNT, you know, whatever they're called these days, are run for their money. Maybe someone's going to come along and make the Premier League an offer that it can't refuse. Should we just... Is this the, it's gone from sort of 2022 where, guys, should we, should we check out? We've been here a while and this might be the time now to, to go do something else. To, 
Should we hold on a bit longer? We could, we could be, we could be, we could look stupid. Again, it's that, it's that looking daft. Yeah. If we sell now, we could be in the business books in five, ten years' times as the idiots who sold out just before the next great big ramp up of club valuations. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on the, the idea that the longer this goes on, the more likely I can and that see also, and that also staying for those reasons you've mentioned. goes into the minority state thing. Yeah. So that's your defence, isn't it? That's that's your sort of anti-embarrassment clause. Yeah. Yeah, I'll sell, I'll sell, but I want a little bit, just in case of the upside. So that in five years' time, when Man United is worth 10 billion, at least I've, at least I've, got, a, I've got some of that. Yeah. You know, I haven't made myself look stupid by selling at five. Which is, what again, one of the reasons that Sir Jim Ratcliffe, one of his bids was yeah, yeah. To, yeah. to keep the Glazers on, because that could be the pathway for, for him owning, owning the club eventually, you know, having full control or owning full ownership, I should say. Um, just before we wrap up as well, there's a couple of other things. You mentioned there about the Saudi at, at New Saudis at Newcastle. Obviously, you've got uh, UAE at um, City, Abu Dhabi Group at City. Does that play into the thinking here? Because Sheikh Jassim and, and the Qataris can look in and go, "Okay, you've got two of our neighbours in terms mm-hmm. of the the Gulf states have got you know clubs in in the Premier League. Do we want to get involved yeah. in that? Could that drive them? Do you think to to maybe persevering? Yeah, maybe? It, absolutely. So you know, it became really obvious to me at the World Cup in Qatar, that Qatar wasn't done. The, yeah. the, there was this sort of sense going in that the World Cup had been difficult, had been a bruising process. You know, people often talk about sports washing. In many ways, that, that had almost been the reverse of sports washing. So no one really knew much about Qatar. And then for sort of 10 years, people talked about Qatar, but often in a very negative way. Yeah. Um, as we got closer to the World Cup, and then actually at the World Cup itself, where you had this sort of massive pulling together of the kind of Arab world, and it, it did go off well, uh, certainly in terms of a TV spectacle, uh, you know, great final, good winner, all that sort of stuff. The Qataris actually sort of came out of that process and thought, no, we like sport, sport's yeah. good, all right? And if we like sport, we want the best. We've just had the World Cup, let's get a, should we get an Olympics? Yeah, let's have an Olympics. And if we've got a club, we've got Paris Saint-Germain, okay, but we want to be in the best league, don't we? Everyone agrees the best league is the Premier League, so why aren't we there? Right. And enough people started to talk about that, and it's like, well, yeah, we really need to be in the Premier League. Can we do that whilst owning PSG? Yeah, I think we can. Yeah. Because we've already seen. Uh, UEFA, Seferin, very close to Nasser Al Khalifi, the boss of Paris Saint-Germain, absolutely lent on him during the European Super League process. Khalifi has a lot of currency there because PSG didn't join in. Khalifi became the boss of the European Club Association, the, the, the fight back, if you like. And ever since that moment, we've seen UEFA put out messages that, you know, multi-club models, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we're going to relax our stance there. Maybe the same entity could have more than one Champions League club. That's still working its way through. I think UEFA is still kind of testing the water there, like what, what the market, what the industry, what fans will accept. But I think um, the concerns around Qatar owning two big clubs that were voiced back in October, sorry, November, December, January, I think they've gone away. I yeah, think the Qataris were cute enough with the way that they they created enough separation. And I, I also think that we might, get, we might get the Saudis at some point thinking, well, yeah, okay, well, a Saudi entity owns Newcastle United, but we have other entities. That could go and buy a, another Premier League club or so. So club, your, your point though about Qatar wanting a Premier League club, I don't think has gone away. We've heard that, I think, yeah, a few people have said that. And the, the sort of the flip side to that is, a Premier League club because I think we were talking to Simon Stone for the BBC the other day and yeah. he said look <laughs> if you're after a Premier League club and you're not getting any joy from Manchester United yeah. yes as you said earlier and I completely agree and I'll always say that Manchester United is a bigger club than the Premier League as we are but do you go for another club do you go for a club that's in London yeah. perhaps or go for a club that Maybe. is just the easier well, we know we know, we know, that the Qataris have had chats with, with Spurs yeah Nasser al has had chats with Spurs again always denied but they happened um, London is a big pull 
people like the London address. But there's no dispute. What you know, I, I'm a neutral. I haven't got a dog in this fight. Manchester United is the biggest club in in the UK. Hundred percent. I think that's fair to say. I'm not saying it's the best. I'm saying it's the biggest. Well, I can't even argue that at the minute. But now we've got Onana, that's going to change. Um, just finally, as well, because you've sort of a lot of what you've done is like you said, collating all this information and working out, you know, getting the, the triple sourced and, and and others, you know, making sure it stands up. A lot of the papers seem to have information from one camp over another. The Times, from what I've read, seems to get a lot of information coming out of Sir Jim Ratcliffe's camp. Not least of all, obviously, when he did his book launch, he gave literal quotes. But yeah. there's, there's, there seems to be more stories about Ineos from the Times. From what I've read, I mean, you know, there's, there's exceptions as well. We've spoke to I've had Jamie Jackson from the Guardian on here. I've spoke to him a few times, and the, the, in, at times in the Guardian, you seem to get more info coming out of the Sheikh Jassim camp. Is that what we're seeing here? We've seen that certain, like you mentioned, PR companies might just be saying to certain newspapers, "Look, here's where we're at." And that's why that certain newspapers are running with, with stories. Yeah. And I'm not knocking them for doing no, that. I get, no, I get it. That's no. the information they're given and they're running with those stories. Yeah. But it does feel like you look at one paper and look to another, you do seem to seem to be more information from a certain camp over yeah. another one. Some, sometimes this boils down to just human relationships. Yeah. So these PR companies, are, you know, I, I probably shouldn't name who they are, but they're, but they're, but they're UK-based, right? They're, they've been hired to deal with queries. They're trying to buy British clubs, right? So you have a British PR presence. It's mainly British journalists who are leading this, um, and maybe you've worked with them before. Maybe you've, you know, maybe you like them. So um, sometimes it can be as simple as that. I think the thing, that, the point about Times and Ineos, I think is is a is a valid point, and um, the story there is that how would I describe this? So Ineos, uh, sorry, Times are owned used to be well by Rupert Murdoch part of the Sky family. Ineos bought Team Sky, the cycling team, in 2018. So there was a relationship. So Sir Jim Radcliffe bought a kind of member of the Times family. So right from the word go, there was a relationship there. And you know, certain really good journalists at the Times got those stories. Originally they were cycling stories and then they became a marathon story and a sailing story and blah, 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 blah. So there are relationships that have been formed there right. because of that Team Sky cycling team being bought by Ineos. And it was no surprise to me that the Times had the serialization rights for the Ineos book that we discussed. Oh, right, yeah. So there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a relationship. Okay. And sometimes that's all. It can, that's enough, right? I've spoken to you before. You did a good job on the last interview I did when we were talking about bikes. What do you want to talk about this time? Football. Okay, fair enough. Human beings. Yeah. Right? Makes that makes a lot of sense. And sometimes you, people have these conspiracy theories and all the rest of it. It's literally you've got a relationship with someone. You know yeah. them. You've worked together before. Or you've had information off him before, which you know is is trustworthy. And it's just basically you know someone speaking to someone they know uh, Matt I could carry on chatting for ages but I'm going to have to stop there because I, I need to let you get off because I think we've been talking for quite a while and there's there's obviously so many different sides to it and undoubtedly it's going to rumble on for a little while longer well look one of the things that came out of the story the feedback from the story was it was it was a bit of a, a risk in that this whole process has been quite hard to predict at times where it's going they could announce tonight yeah. They could announce tonight and I could look very stupid. I don't think they will announce tonight, but they could. Of course. No journalist can sit, sit in this chair and say they absolutely know what's happening. That much I can tell you for sure. Because we've seen the number of false starts, false dawns, predictions of this happening or that happening. All we've got is hunches, educated guesses. And my educated guess at the moment is that this process has stalled can resume the gla and my my other big educated guess and this is what I've had this for a long time is the glazers themselves cannot decide what to do and they're really the only people that matter those six siblings they cannot decide what to do and is it is that what it's going to take for, to, to unstall this yeah they need to decide it's not up to any else it's not up to change the same it's up to the glazer siblings well, th there is a way yeah that you can give them a nudge, and that's to raise your bids. But those two bidders have said, no, here's, here's our bids, we, we like them. And the Glazers are looking there going, 
it's not quite what we're expecting. It's not bad. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And they can't, they can't agree. And if we do this, we might be side up in mitigation. If we do this, oh, the Premier League clubs are going to, you know, get all funny about it and we could be tied up in some sort of, you know, the Newcastle deal took a long time to go through. Um, if we do this, we're out. We're properly out. But if we do this, we're in for a bit, but then Radcliffe will try and boot us out at some point and we won't have, we won't have the say anymore. Do we want to be silent partners? There's no, for them, the easy scenario hasn't happened. That's it's just so frustrating. So what, you, so what do you do when you're stuck? Um, you do nothing. Yeah, well, yeah, that's it. So that's what they're doing at the minute. And we're in this sort of quandary where you've got two bidders are saying no, that's it, and then you've got the owners who are saying we don't know, and we're, or we're arguing, or we're unsure, or we're, we're you know some of us want to do it, others don't. And like you say, no one really knows other than the Glazer siblings. Yeah, yeah. Well. Thanks for being honest anyway. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> it's better than coming on here and lying and saying, oh, yeah, they're going to sell tonight. Don't worry about it. It's all good. Um, Matt, it's great chatting to you. Loved all that. And I love the article. If you've not done so already, go and check out Matt Slayer on The Athletic. There's a link in the description. You can read about what is happening or what isn't happening with the bid. And it's like I said, there's loads of information there. And there's loads of other great articles, not just on Southend as well, on Manchester United. Um, so make sure you're checking that out. Don't forget as well, if you're not doing already, to hit like, share and subscribe. We'll be over in the US this week. We're going on tour. Myself, Adam McCullough, Stephen House and Joe Smith. We're all going to be out there to follow Manchester United in New York, in San Diego, in Houston and in Vegas. So make sure you are checking us out on that. That's been Matt Slater from The Athletic for a one-on-one -on -one interview. I've been Jay Thanks for watching.